talking about uh, the myth of art, artificial intelligence. This is a book written by Larson. Um, we're going to talk about the book written by Larson. He, um, I don't know when he wrote this thing. Twenty, wait a minute, twenty twenty one. Okay. Um, this is in the news right now. Uh, people are debating as to whether we can live with artificial intelligence. I, I saw a news program the other day that the individual said that it's going to lead to high uh, unemployment in the in the world, not just in the United States, but in the world. So this is really right there where we are right now. They're uh, thinking of writing legislation controlling uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, the um, the companies that are, are putting together the artificial intelligence, Microsoft and and Apple, uh, the Japanese have lots of several different companies that are working on artificial intelligence. Um, the they're they're screaming that uh, that uh, we can't do that. That uh, this is this will release humanity for uh, more. I don't know what we're supposed to be doing for not working. And how are we going to live if we don't make money by working? Anyway, uh, this is this is in the news right now. This is something that's uh, and and this our lecture may be controversial because Larson's not real much in favor of it. Uh, e. J. Larson, uh, I think his first name's Eric. Where are you, Eric? Yeah, Eric J. Larson. The myth of artificial intelligence: Why computers can't think the way that we do. Uh, they can't, right? At this point, they cannot because we are, well, we'll see why in just a minute. That's what the book looks like, if you ever see the uh, the cover of it. Okay. The story of artificial intelligence starts with computer pioneer Alan Turing, who published a paper on the topic in 1950. Now, you'll have to remember that the first computers, there have been... Um, uh, elementary computers for a really long time, but then during World War II, uh, they put together, um, uh, especially Alan Turing, uh, put together a uh, computer to uh, uh, crack the uh, German uh, code and the Japanese code, actually. Uh, so we have been working on this for a long time. Uh, 1950, of course, this is after the war. Can we? Can we dismantle the computers? Uh, do we have to uh, keep uh, this artificial intelligence going? And uh, uh, Turing wrote a book in 1950. Turing uh, proposed to test a computer's intelligence by having a computer and human perform the same task. Now, what was going on in, in 1950 was that uh, uh, computers were too, just way too big and uh, and slow. The task will then be judged by a group of judges, and if the majority of the judges can't accurately identify which is the computer and which is the human, then the computer wins. And this is known as a Turing test. At Bletchley Park during World War II, England's most progressive thinkers came together to break German and Japanese communication codes. Guessing is, is known in science as forming hypotheses, and it is absolutely fundamental to the advancement of human knowledge. The Bletchley effort amounted to a system of guessing well. And that's a picture of, this is what Bletchley Park looks like, and that's what it'll look like on the inside. Intelligence is situational. There is no such thing as general intelligence. Your brain is one piece in a broader system, which includes your body, your environment, other humans, and, and uh, your culture as, as a whole. Intelligence is contextual. Far from existing in a vacuum, any individual intelligence will always be both defined and limited by its environment. Human intelligence is largely externalized. It can, it's contained uh, not in your brain, but in your civilization. So if you live in England, uh, your intelligence is one thing. If you live in, in Russia, it's another thing. If you live in China or India or the United States or Australia, or Brazil, it's going to be something totally different. Our brains are modules in a cognitive system uh, much larger than itself. And this is something that we need to remember because different civilizations, different cultures may define intelligence differently. Can intuition be programmed? The idea of programming intuition ignores the fundamental fact about our own smarts. Humans have social intelligence. 
We have emotional intelligence. We use our minds other than to solve problems and puzzles. And the problem is that when we take an IQ test, these two things are not taken into account, the, hum the social intelligence and the emotional intelligence. Uh, the only thing that it's measuring is problems and puzzles. And, and I've had a problem with, uh, with intelligence tests for a long, long time. Uh, when I started studying psychology, I realized, well, okay, um, wh why, is, why is there a time limit on, on your intelligence test? Why, why, why do they give you 30 minutes to answer 65 questions? Why don't they give you as much time as you need? And if you can answer a lot of them correctly, then, then you're intelligent. Uh, why why is, does it have to be time? Did anybody tell Albert Einstein, okay, Al, you've got 15 minutes to come up with the theory of relativity. Uh, let's get it done. And, of course, it took him years to figure out the theory of rel relativity. Uh, but he's considered one of the most brilliant men that has ever existed. Wow. The problem-solving view of intelligence helps explain the production of invariably narrow applications of uh, artificial intelligence throughout its history. Game playing has been a source of uh, constant inspiration for the development of advanced uh, artificial intelligence techniques, but games are simplifications of life that reward simplified views of intelligence. A chess program plays chess, but does not but does rather poorly when it tries to drive a car. You wouldn't want to be uh, on the road if a chess-playing uh, uh, robot was playing, was dr trying to drive your car. He's not programmed to drive a car. He's programmed to play chess. He may, might win every game of chess, but can he actually drive a car? And the answer is probably no. Treating intelligence as problem solving gives us narrow uh, gives us a narrow application. If machines could learn to become general, we would witness a smooth transition from specific applications to general thinking beings. We would have artificial intelligence to accomplish their goals. What are now called machine learning systems must each learn something specific. Researchers call this this giving machines a bias. And it does have a bias. It plays chess, and it plays chess very, very well. But it's like a uh, an individual that can can. Uh, it's like Rain Man. Rain Man could uh, do mathematics, and he could count cards. But that's all he could do. He couldn't function in society. And the machines are exactly the same same way. Uh, it, being a genius is called savant. It's that's that's what. That's an, another definition of, of, uh, of intelligence, is savant, extreme intelligence. Uh, but at the same time, these individuals we normally refer to as an idiot savant. Why? Because they are good at one thing, but they can't do other things. Researchers have realized that giving a machine learning system a bias to learn a particular application or task means that it will do more poorly on other tasks, there is an inverse correlation between a machine's success in learning some one thing and its success in learning some other things. Machine learning bias is typically understood as a source of learning error, a technical problem. Machine learning bias can introduce error simply because the system doesn't look for certain solutions in the first place. But bias is actually necessary in machine learning. It's part of the learning itself. Just like if you wanted to study medicine, you would have to study medicine and, uh, and not deal with, uh, uh, with literature. You know, why in the world would you have to read Moby Dick if you're going to be a doctor? Moby Dick has nothing to do with medicine. Uh, and, and this is one of the things that you see. A lot of individuals, and I've been around a lot of really intelligent people. I've been around a lot of uh, college professors. Uh, I've been around uh, a lot of, uh, I went to a college that was a, a pre-med school, and I'll tell you what, those guys are pretty pretty damn smart. Uh, I'm not going to argue that point, but one of the things that they weren't was well-rounded, <laughs> because they focused on medicine, and that's really all they knew. I uh, worked for a doctor in, uh, in Oklahoma uh, who was a brilliant diagnostician. He was just amazing. 
Uh, but his knowledge of politics, oh my goodness gracious, what, what a dummy. I mean, he, he just had no sense of pol politics at all. Uh, and of course, you know, I'm a little bit different. I have a lot of general intelligence, which doesn't exist. I know, we just said that it didn't exist. But uh, uh, I have uh, five degrees in, in four different areas. So I've concentrated in four different areas. Uh, what are they? They're English, medicine, uh, political science, and uh, and uh, psychology, of course. <laughs> I'm teaching psychology. <laughs> Things occur to us. We reason through our observations and what we already know. Answers pop into our heads. All of this uh, buzz of biological magic remains opaque. It's processing still uncharted. Machines tasked with designing new and better machines face a fundamental stumbling block. Any design for a new machine must be set specified in the parent machine. The parent machine would necessarily be more complex, not less, than its creation. An organization which synthesizes something is necessarily more complicated, of a higher order, than the organization it synthesizes. In other words, it could only uh, create a, a, a machine that was as intelligent as it was. It couldn't go beyond that. No machine could go beyond um, the uh, intelligence level of the, uh, of the primary machine. So there would be no growth. There would be no progression. There could be no progression as far as that machine was concerned. Somebody else would have to pr uh, produce a more intelligent machine because machines can't, they can't progress. They can only learn what you tell them they can learn. They can only do what you tell them they can do. They're like computers. Computers can only tell you what you ask it. That's not going to give you information that you're not asking for. <clears throat> Inference is to bring about a new thought, which in logic amounts to drawing a conclusion and more generally involves using what we already know and what we see or observe to update prior beliefs. Interference is a basic cognitive act for intelligent minds. If an uh, artificial intelligence system is not interfering at all, it doesn't really deserve to be called artificial intelligence. We know a lot of things, but only inference gets us to, to a new knowledge. Real-world circumstances are always changing, so real-time inference is common and necessary. The ability to determine which bits of knowledge are relevant is not a computational skill. Human insights are not arrived at by formula. Scientists frame hypotheses, then they test them. But the hypotheses aren't arrived at mechanically. They sometimes just pop into scientists' heads, typically after mastery of the field. Just like this guy. Whoa, there it is. Copernicus posited that the Earth revolved around the Sun. He made a conjecture that went against all previous knowledge. The fact that conjectures lead to discoveries doesn't fit with mechanical accounts of science. It contradicts them. But detective work, scientific discovery, innovation, and common sense are all workings of the mind. They are inferences that artificial intelligence scientists in search of generally intelligent machines must somehow account for. Deductive reasoning is a logical approach where you progress from general ideas to specific conclusions. The problem with deductive reasoning is that it never adds knowledge. Deduction is useless in the pursuit of knowledge, and it only clears up disputed beliefs if bona fide errors in reasoning have been made. Conspiracy theorists might never make a deductive reasoning mistake. Just uh, It's just that they adopt premises as true that others uh, find dubious or just crazy. They've never been proven wrong. <clears throat> Induction means acquiring knowledge from experience. Induction captures the everyday idea that we gain the ability to explain and predict by observing happenings in the world. Modern uh, artificial intelligence, intelligence 
is based on statistical analysis, and so it relies on an inductive framework, which is useful for many commercial applications. Artificial intelligence can offer recommendations, a type of prediction based on past observations. At its root, all inductions are based on enumeration. And if you've ever watched uh, Mr. Spock uh, on Star Trek, that's what he's doing. He's, in, in, uh, he's deducing um, the, the percentages of, of something uh, being a, a working or something not working. And he always gives percentages. I don't know if you notice, but he always talks in percentages. Well, uh, this has a 35% chance of, of working. <clears throat> Machine learning can never supply real understanding because the analysis of data does not bridge to knowledge of the uh, causal structure of the real world, essential for intelligence. The ladder of causation steps up with associating data points, seeing and observing, to intervening in the world doing, which requires knowledge of causes. Then it moves to counterfactual thinking, like in imagining, understanding, and asking, what if I had some diff something different? What if I had done something different? Common sense is what enables two people to engage in ordinary conversation. The problem of common sense, and in particular language understanding, which requires it, has been a signal of concern among artificial intelligence researchers since the field's inception. Machine learning is getting computers to improve their performance based on experience. There are two types of learning. Supervised learning that is identified information that leads to a desired outcome. Unsupervised learning where the masses of data is analyzed to determine a pattern of information. Early artificial intelligence scientists assumed many problems in the real world could be solved by supplying rules amounting to functions with known outputs as with addition. It turned out that most problems that count as interesting to artificial intelligence researchers have unknown functions. Hence, we now have machine learning, which seeks to approximate or, or simulate these unknowns. This fakeness of machine learning does un uh, goes unnoticed when uh, system performance is notably close to a human's or better. But the simulative nature of machine learning gets exposed quickly when the real world departs from the learned simulation. And this is one of the problems that, uh, that we have seen with ChatGPT. And this is one of the reasons I don't want you to use it. One of the reasons is because you're not doing your own work. You're letting it uh, do your research for you. And you're letting it write your paper for you. Now, that's not good because if you can't write, if... If you can't put things into words that make sense, then where are you going to go? I mean, what are you going to do? It's like not being able to talk. <clears throat> but the other problem with ChatGPT is that it makes up it makes up information. It creates it, and it's fake. And you can't tell it's fake because it sounds good. But I can tell it's fake because when I look up the references, sometimes they're not there. And why aren't they there? Because they made it up. But it looks good. And if I didn't check all my references, all your references, when you write a paper, then I might miss it. And I might think that, wow, you write really well. Your grammar is really good. Your, your sentence construction is, is, uh, is perfect. This is fantastic. All this information is really good. But some, some of the information may be completely bogus. And that's the problem with ChatGPT. Is the, it fakes, and it fakes things so close to the, the, the actual information that uh, it sounds plausible to the untrained eye, or even to the trained eye, the trained eye that's not uh, looking very deeply into what you have said. And this is why I don't want you to use ChatGPT. For one thing, you need to learn to be able to do this on your own. I would rather see a a, a, a paper with poor grammar, and I just I just graded a paper with where I had to re reconstruct just about every sentence. I'd rather see that paper than a one that's the grammar is perfect, but it's written it's not written by a human. It's written by a machine because at least that human 
thought about that sentence. They put the the uh, the sentences together incorrectly, but I'd ra much rather see that because they're thinking themselves than uh, let a robot do it. <clears throat> and the other problem is, hey, you don't know where this person is. This guy may be, you know, some some strange fellow in uh, in South Africa who thinks that uh, that only uh, white people are, are good. You know, you never know. You never know what you're, what you're running into. Or who's the one that programmed the, uh, uh, the information? You just never know. It might be something somebody with totally different ideas than you, than you have. Um, let me give you an example. Uh, <laughs> I got a paper uh, a couple semesters ago from an individual um, using chat GPT and uh, it had it said that American Indians wanted to assimilate to a white culture because white culture was superior um, I don't think I don't think you guys want to say that I don't think anybody on, on the I know I wouldn't want to say that you know where did that come from well it's chat GPT it uh, it takes uh, all this information and it uh, generalizes everything anyway. And I guess there's enough white supremacists out there that uh, that piece of information is what came out. <clears throat> but I'm assuming it certainly wasn't the idea of my student. <clears throat> the limits of a machine learning system's world are precisely established by the database given uh, to it in training. Any given database uh, data set is only a, a very small time slice representing partial evidence of the behavior of real-world systems. A trained system can predict outcomes seemingly understanding a problem until an unexpected change or event renders the simulation worthless. Simulations that fail can be worse than worthless as with a robot car or an automated prediction that instills false confidence. The most powerful learning systems are much more narrow and brittle than we might suppose because the systems are just simulations. All the problems of induction bedevil uh, machine learning and data-centric uh, uh, approaches to artificial intelligence. Data are just approved facts stored in computers for accessibility. And ob observed facts don't get us to the general understanding of intelligence. Big data is an inevitable consequence as computers become more powerful, statistical techniques like machine learning become better, and new business models emerge, all from data and its analysis. What we now refer to as data science is really an old field given, a new, given new wings and massive volumes of data, mostly made available by the growth of the web. The focus on deep learning makes sense. The algorithms rather than the data are responsible for trouncing human champions at Go, which is a, a Chinese game, uh, mastering Atari games, driving cars, and the rest of the artificial intelligence successes. Big data has found a home in, in artificial intelligence as data-driven approaches like machine learning all benefit from huge volumes of data for training models and testing them. As an observer uh, put it recently, big data has become big data a, uh, artificial intelligence. <clears throat> machine learning systems are sophisticated counting machines. The frequency assumption comes into play because the greater the frequency of hits on a feature, the more useful it is. Sarcasm is particularly opaque to machine learning in part because it's less frequent than literal, literal meaning. Counting turns out to work well for certain obvious tasks online, but works against more subtle, subtle ones. Sarcasm isn't a word-based feature, and neither is it as frequent as literal meaning. Machine learning is notoriously obtuse about such uh, language phenomena. Sarcasm. So you can fool a, an AI machine by using sarcasm. The other thing is that it's like Google. You know, if you type, uh, uh, you type in there, what did I just type it? Tom Petty. Uh, what does Google give you? Well, Google gives you the, the sites 
that most people click on when they are looking for information about Tom Petty. Uh, companies can pay Google uh, money to put their sites above other sites. And that's the way it works. That's how Google makes their money. They sell, they sell uh, information slots to different companies and put their, those, uh, those companies first so that people will see them first. How often do you go to the third page if you're looking for information? Not very often. Usually you uh, find something on the first page. And usually one of the first things is Wikipedia. But, it, but uh, there are, are uh, in the old days, uh, anybody could put anything on Wikipedia. Not now. It's, uh, it's more edited than that. But uh, once upon a time, so some of the inf information... And Wikipedia may be inaccurate. Saturation occurs when adding more data, more examples to a learning algorithm or a statistical technique adds nothing to the performance of the system. And this is what it looks like. And some, it actually goes down. The performance goes down. When we seek to understand particular facts rather than regularities, we are forced into a kind of conjuring, the selection of invention of a hypothesis that might explain the fact. Induction moves from facts to generalizations that give us knowledge of regularity. But abduction moves from observation to a particular fact to a rule of hypothesis that explains it. Abduction is tied closely to reasoning from events to their causes. Abduction captures the insight that much of everyday reasoning is a kind of detective work where facts, such as data, as clues are seen to help make sense of things. Humans are extraordinarily good at hypothesizing, which is not explainable by mechanics, but by an operation described as instinct. Guessing from infinite possibilities, the most plausible hypothesis is selected. These factors must be included in developing artificial intelligence. Without an abduction step, inductions are blind and deductions are useless. If deduction is inadequate and induction is inadequate, then there must be a theory of abduction. Since there is no theory, it can be concluded that there is yet to be a path to artificial general intelligence. Causal information about the world cannot be extracted from associations and data, so explanations involving why or how questions can even be formulated, let alone answered. Causal knowledge forms part of the common sense uh, understanding of the world and explains why data as effects or clues to prior causes that contribute to understanding can be seen. Imagination involves inter inferences that don't exist in a database. Imagining requires conjecture, if anything does. Abduction is inference that sits in the center of all intelligence. Most of what is known is implicit. Knowledge is brought into consciousness, making it explicit, only when circumstances require it, like when someone is surprised or has to think through something deliberately. All implicit knowledge might be necessary for some inference or other, but the total amount is vast. The knowledge base of an ordinary person is unbelievably large, and inputting and representing it in a computer is a gargantuan task. Abduction gets harder and harder. It soon departs from all known conceptions of automatic inference for, or computations, uh, take scientific discovery or in innovation. Human beings invent languages, concepts, and laws to explain the world. This is creative abduction. Creative abductions leap to novel conceptual frameworks themselves. And of course, that's one of the, the uh, reasons that we had the, the flat earth hypothesis or that uh, everything ro rotates around the earth. We're in the center of the universe and everything rotates around us. Uh, now we know, of course, we rotate around the sun. Uh, we know that the Earth isn't flat. It's an orb of sorts. I guess it's pear-shaped. Mysterious and wonderful abduction inferences pervade human culture. 
They are largely what makes us human. What did I read the other day? They were talking about uh, the Earth's core is going slower and it might reverse itself. <clears throat> but that's not going to change our orbit. It will, we're going to lose, we've always gained a second, but now we're going to lose a second uh, every year instead of gain a second. And of course, they're not exactly sure how to work with that because computers uh, don't understand these things. You can't teach a computer these kinds of information. They have to, Everything has to be... Everything has to be uh, algorithmic. It has to fit in with the algorithm, and that's not part of the algorithm. All roads leads here. All, uh, I, uh, all reads. All roads lead here. Artificial intelligence intelligence lacks a fundamental theory, a theory of abductive inference. The problem is that little of of the everyday world is captured by timeless truths. And even when there is certainty, deductive inference ignores considerations of relevance. Inductive inference provides provisional knowledge because the future might not resemble the past, and the future almost never resembles the past. Things, they are changing, and they are continually changing. Now, the problem is we have one political system that wants, or one political group that wants things to go back to the way they were, which is impossible, and the other, the other, uh, the other group of, of uh, political, the other political idea is for progressive thought and progress, uh, progressing through what has to happen and what's going to happen anyway. Intelligent thought involves knowledge that outstrips what can be bluntly observed, but it's a mystery how knowledge is acquired and how the right knowledge is applied to a problem at the right time. Neither deduction or induction illuminates this core mystery of human intelligence. The abductive inference that was proposed long ago does, but no, but no one knows how to program it. In pragmatics, what is said is tightly dependent on how it is said and why it is said. What people mean is almost never a literal function of what they, they word for word say. This feature of ordinary talk, studied in linguistics as pragmatics, is what makes language interpretation hard for artificial intelligence, but meaningful, interesting, and generally easy and natural for people. And these are idioms. Uh, a word or phrase, an idiom is a word or phrase whose meaning can't be understood outside its cultural context. Example, Lisa's father worked Lisa's father works long hours to bring home the bacon. The, the literal meaning is that he actually brings home bacon, but the actual meaning, the idiomatic meaning, is that he works really hard to bring home money so that they can buy bacon. <clears throat> Prose showcases the ubiquity of pra pragmatic a phenomena in language in nearly every ordinary sentence. It's inescapable. Deixis refers to words like pronouns that cannot be understood or disambiguated without knowledge of context, like me or he or here. Deixis uh, means pointing, and uh, language often points, and this is understood by the listener in context. A system engaged in a conversation not res resorting to can tricks must keep track of all of this. So if you say here, uh, I'm in Iowa, and if I say here, I'm talking about Iowa. And if you say here, you're talking about Phoenix or Sali or Chin Li or Snowflake or, or Window Rock or Crystal. or You could be talking about anywhere. In the early part of the 20th century, and, and a computer can't figure that out, if you say here, you, you mean where you are. And a computer has a difficult time understanding that. In the early part of the 20th century, the philosopher of language, Paul Grice, offered maxims for successful conversation. The maxim of quantity, try to be as informative as possible and give as much information as is needed, but no more. The maxim of quality, try to be truthful and don't give information that is false or that is not supported by evidence. 
the maxim of re relation. Try to be relevant and say things that are pertinent to the discussion. The maxim of manner. Try to be as clear, as brief, and as orderly as you can, and avoid obscurity and ambiguity. 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 <laughs> Why couldn't I say that? In 2004, an IBM research at IBM Research, the head researcher said, we're going to make history. Money isn't an object. Find a way to build a system that plays Jeopardy. IBM assembled a team of top talent and spent the next three years doing due diligence on the requirements for a question-answering system capable of playing world-class Jeopardy. The magical quality of IBM's Watson system is its search for answers. Fully 95% of all answers to Jeopardy questions are just Wikipedia titles. This serendipitous discovery made the entire effort possible. Simply matching questions to Wikipedia titles would be itself result in superhuman level gameplay. As usual, the devil is in the details, but it took them three years to figure this out. They, they tried to uh, uh, use dictionaries. They tried to use encyclopedias. Nothing worked. But then they downloaded Wikipedia, and by golly, it was unstoppable, as you can see. And there's the game. These are two of the, the, uh, the best champions. And there's, there's a Watson with three times as much money as either of those guys. Watson crushed Jeopardy, but had no other function. Watson proved once and for all that, that all successful artificial intelligence is narrow. Watson is not a step toward general intelligence, but rather further evidence that the quest for generality remains mired in mystery and confusion. While the IBM team did score an impressive victory using a powerful hybrid system, it did not discover a key to language understanding. All the problems of programming abduction inferences for general intelligence remains. Every reasoning machine has had two inherent impotencies. It is destitute of all originality and initiative. It cannot find its own problems. It cannot feed itself. It cannot direct itself between different possible procedures. The capacity of a machine has absolute limitations. It has been contrived to do a certain thing, and it can do nothing else. In 2005, there was a blogger revolution to make the Internet as free as possible. Web denizens were poised to rewrite the rule books, ridding the world of stodgy gatekeepers like mainstream press and media who unfairly controlled the production and flow of news and knowledge. Power to the people was the trope of the mid-2000s, spread endlessly in blogs, commentary, in an online collaboration of hive mentality. Instead, the billionaires took over and made more money. The human brain has more than a hundred trillion neuronal synapses, so a computer recording a simple binary piece of information about synapses would require 100 terabytes. The amount of storage needed to store even this simple information every second over the course of a day for one person would be more than 100,000 terabytes, or 100 petabytes. Wait a minute, this tells us how big that is. A petabyte, 20 million four-drawer filing cabinets filled with text. Wow. Okay. <clears throat> So 50 petabytes is the entire written works of mankind from beginning of recorded history in all languages. 50 petabytes. And just to, to understand uh, the synapses of the brain would take 100, terab uh, well, take 100 petabytes. Wow, that's a lot. Supercomputers hold about 10 petabytes. This quick calculation doesn't account for the changes in connectivity and positioning of synapses over time. Counting how these co connections change just after a good night's sleep or a class in mathematics amounts to a whopping figure. Attempts have been made to promote abductive reasoning in computers or representing an advance in applying machine learning to biological data sets. The approach has an average error rate of 2 in 10. This has 
ominous implications for any strategy for reverse engineering the human brain. It is the shallow logic behind such approaches that spell deeper trouble for the institution of science. Artificial intelligence and big data works only when we have prior theory. A great deal of confusion and potential trouble for science lies precisely with this point. Neuroscience, unlike particle physics, has no unifying theoretical framework. The challenge for neuroscientists is to defend the current data-driven model and the absence of theoretical insights making sense of, the, of and guiding the deluge of data. Society is about to experience an epidemic of false positives coming out of big data projects. When we have large amounts of data, your appetite for hypotheses tends to be even larger. If it's growing faster than the statistical strength of the data, then many of our influences are likely to be false. They are likely to be white noises. The danger of overfitting theories, models, to data where Overfitting here means spuriously matching a set of data points to a description that contains no genuine explanatory power. The description does not generalize to new, unseen data points in the underlying distribution in question. In other words, a round peg in a square hole. It just doesn't work. The simplest case of model of a set of data points is a linear interpolation of a scatter plot. A straight line shows the average interpolation, interpolation of the scattered data, and as such gives a useful model predicting the behavior of the data. Overfitting, making the data fit the hypothesis, gives false confidence on existing data, but quickly shatters this illusion when new data arrives that doesn't fit the model or the theory. New ideas can't be predicted, and thus we should expect the con consolidation of the web into big tech will skew work on artificial intelligence toward narrow applications on the profit curve, where, while inventions that can never be counted on get short shrift. Over the last year, magazines around the world have discussed the benefits and dangers of artificial intelligence technology. The May issue of AARP Bulletin warns of grandparent scams where artificial intelligence software synthesizes a grandchild's voice and creates a plea for quick cash to the child's synthesized voice taken from a social media post. The June issue of APA's Monitor on Psychology suggested that psychology professors find a way to teach using chat GPT, even vaguely suggesting that critical thinking could be supported by helping students think critically about topics they're already familiar with. Like talking with a colleague, it can be an interactive partner. Huh? Even the Saturday Evening Post has waded in on the debate of AI and chat GPT. Altman states that artificial intelligence has been helping us for decades with computer problems. Clippy, the creepy animated paperclip from an earlier version of Microsoft Word, hovered around and made faces while you typed. While you typed, that was was artificial intelligence. Clippy. It has been observed that ChatGPT will pick up on negative societal biases. For instance, if an alg algorithm is trying to determine which job candidate is the best fit, it will look at what qualifications correlate with a successful employee. If the company hired mainly non-diverse people, the algorithm will continue to recommend non-diverse candidates. This can have dire consequences when algorithms are assessing credit worthiness for borrowers or recidivism rates for convicts as well as suitability for employment. If artificial intelligence knows everything about you, it can manipulate you in ways that will make targeted marketing quite uh, look quaint. And in the universe of fake news, the fakes are going to get a whole lot more realistic and difficult to challenge. Imagine the possibility of creating a fake video showing a politician mouthing words they've never actually spoken or participating in some shameful activity that never actually occurred. That's becoming easier than ever to do. As the saying goes, knowledge is power. 
Cynical opinion leaders and crooks will certainly use artificial intelligence to mislead and defraud. After the June issue of Monitor on Psychology tried to convince psychology professors to embrace the technology don't get left behind, the July-August uh, issue offered a different take on artificial intelligence. A, uh, artificial intelligence uh, tools used in healthcare have discriminated against people based on their race and disability status. Rogue chat bots, bots have spread misinformation, professed their love for users, and sexually harassed minors, which prompted leaders in tech and science to call a pause to research in March. What protection could help ensure privacy, transparency, and equity as these tools are increasingly used across society? Researchers analyzed interactions at a hotel in Malaysia, employing both robots and human workers. After hotel guests interacted with robot workers, they treated the human workers with less respect. There was a spillover effect, where suddenly we had these agents that are tools, and they can cause us to view humans as tools too. In addition to making mental health support more affordable and accessible, chatbots can help people who may, uh, who may shy away from a human therapist, such as those uh, new to therapy or people with social anxiety. They also offer the opportunity for the field to reimagine itself, to intentionally build culturally competent artificial intelligences that can make psychology more inclusive. My concern is that artificial intelligence won't be inclusive. At the end of the day, it has to be trained. And who's the one that's programming it? In January, the mental health nonprofit COCO offered counseling to 4,000 people without telling them the support came from ChatGPT3. Reports have also emerged that getting therapy from generative language models, which produce different text in each interaction, making it difficult to test for clinical validity or, or safety, has led to suicides and other harms. Before integrating artificial intelligence tools into their workflow, many clinicians want more information on how patient data are being handled and what apps are safe and ethical to use. The field also needs a better understanding of the error rates and types of errors those tools tend to make. Psychologists have long measured behavior through self-reports and lab experiments, but they can now use artificial intelligence to monitor things like social media activity, credit card spending, GPS data, and smartphone metrics. That actually changes a lot because suddenly we can look at individual differences as they play out in everyday behavior. The University of Notre Dame is testing an algorithm that collects screenshots of patients' online activity to flag the use or viewing of terms related to suicide and self-harm. By pairing that data with EMAs, ecological momentary assessments, and psychological metrics from a smartwatch, they hope to build a tool that can alert clinicians in real time about patients' suicide risk. And there are the, the articles that I've just been talking about. And that is the end of the lecture. You can think whatever you want. I'm thinking that I am a lot smarter than any robot. <clears throat> and so are you. We shouldn't, we shouldn't give them too much power.